I've always been drawn to science fiction. There is something about using technology to explore morality, mortality, and just life in general. But what exactly is science fiction? According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, science fiction is fiction dealing principally with the impact of actual or imagined science on society, or individuals, or having a scientific factor as an essential orienting component. In Darko Subin's 1978 essay on what is and is not science fiction, he states that in order for something to be science fiction, it must have novum. Novum is a term used by science fiction scholars to describe the scientifically plausible innovations used by science fiction narratives. It argues that the genre of science fiction is distinguished from fantasy by the story being driven by a novum validated by cognitive logic. This means that the hypothetical new thing which the story is about can be imagined to exist by scientific means rather than by magic. It also needs to be hegemonic, which essentially means that the narrative not only needs to have those sci-fi elements, the novum, it also needs to be the dominant feature in the narrative. For example, in the Spider-Man films, there is novum. A radioactive spider bites Peter Parker and then he gains his powers through this mutation. Audience members know that while a spider bite can't actually grant you powers in real life, it is a plausible enough reason for us to accept it in the narrative because it is based on a concept that is rooted in reality. So is Spider-Man a sci-fi film? Well, not really, because while it does have sci-fi elements, that is not the intent of the film. The intent is to primarily be an action film, and this intent is key to determining its genre. Though it is important to know, too, that most media doesn't just stick to one genre. Fantasy and sci-fi tend to get lumped together. After all, they are similar. They're like cousins, like horror and thrillers. You've probably heard the Arthur C. Clarke quote which states, Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. While I do agree, it must be noted that sci-fi is not fantasy, as fantasy generally tends to reject cognitive logic and claims a more occult or theological logic to explain its narrative, while sci-fi has to be somewhat related to an existing scientific theory or mechanic and embraces cognitive logic. Like Ray Bradbury said, I define science fiction as the art of the possible. Fantasy is the art of the impossible. Science fiction, again, is a history of ideas, and there are always ideas that work themselves out and become real and happen in the world, and fantasy comes along and says, we're going to break all the laws of physics. So we defined what science fiction is, but why is it important? What makes this genre so compelling? As Joanna Russ wrote in her 1975 article, Towards an Aesthetic of Science Fiction, Science fiction, like medieval painting, addresses itself to the mind, not the eye. We are not presented with a representation of what we know to be true through direct experience. Rather, we are given what we know to be true through other means, or in the case of science fiction, what we know to be at least possible. Thus, a science fiction writer can portray Jupiter as easily as a medieval painter can portray heaven. Neither of them has been there, but that doesn't matter. That is the spirit of sci-fi. It's about showing and shaping the future in innovative ways that still ring true to the audience. It inspires thinking and answers our what ifs. And it doesn't just show, do this by posing questions in science. It poses questions in ethics, philosophy, politics, and economics. Science fiction can easily become science facts. We saw this with Brave New World and Gattaca and the CRISPR designer babies, or with the concept of weightlessness and Jules Verne's 1856 novel, Round the Moon, or with Arthur C. Clarke's many predictions. Sci-fi is a window to other worlds, or other versions of our world that shines a light on how to make it a better place, or at least serve as cautionary tales on how, if we continue on certain paths, destruction could ensue. But for all its groundbreaking qualities, the genre is not without flaws. Sci-fi has a particularly bad rep for how it handles racial issues. In the 1977 essay, Why Blacks Don't Read Sci-Fi by African-American author Charles R. Sanders, he states, White American science fiction writers were capable of stretching their imaginations to the point of conceptualizing aliens with sympathetic qualities. A black man or woman in a spacesuit was an image beyond the limits of their imaginations. If blacks appeared at all in the pages of the science fiction pulp magazines, they were presented as offensive darky stereotypes. The genre, he states, was as white as a Ku Klux Klan meeting.
Sci-fi writers frequently take inspiration from the settings and history of marginalized people to create these fictional worlds, yet those said people are rarely present in these narratives. We see time and time again poorly done allegories for racism, colonization, and slavery. We see it in games like Detroit Become Human, where the Android Rebellion is a literal copy and paste of the civil rights movement, and in countless other narratives. We also see the aesthetic that is specific to a race and culture be used while the people of that culture are erased from the narrative, a scene with Dune and its use of Islamic and Mena culture. This co-option of aesthetic in sci-fi is especially prevalent with East Asian cultures. This is known as techno-orientalism. Techno-orientalism is the phenomenon of imagining Asia and Asians in hypo or hyper-technological terms in cultural productions and political discourse. In Lin Fung's review of Jane Chishan Park's book, Yellow Future, Oriental Style in Hollywood Cinema, she states, Whilst Park recognizes that the post-1980s cinematic representation of Asian tropes and themes in Hollywood movies has deviated from earlier more explicit stereotypical depictions of East Asia and Asian people, she, as a Korean-American scholar, also argues that the Oriental style and techno-Orientalism are part of the ongoing historical process of racialization of East Asians in the United States. According to Park, the popularity of the Oriental style and techno-Orientalism in Hollywood cinema manifests itself through the social perceptions, or more accurately, fear, in America that East Asia has an ability to appropriate and improve on Western technology and to beat the West at its own game. The problem is not necessarily that these cultures are being portrayed, but rather how they are being portrayed. It is not to say that sci-fi should never use the culture or cultural iconography of people of color, but when you use a culture for world building, then proceed to erase those people from the narrative, or have them in the narrative, but dehumanize them, then it becomes a problem. As Chloe Gong states in her 2019 article, Techno-Orientalism and Science Fiction, as I said before, Techno-Orientalism is not an inherently xenophobic concept because the envisioning of a bleak Asian future can be just that, a future that is Asian and also bleak for various reasons. But when done by most writers today, especially white Western writers, these tropes are fear-mongering and effectively xenophobic. Many people of color have created works of fiction that takes us from the back seat and put us on the center stage so that we can have control over how our futures are portrayed. And in the case of black people and Afrofuturism, to show that we do have a place in the future. Afrofuturism is a cultural aesthetic, philosophy of science and philosophy of history that explores the developing intersection of African diaspora culture with technology. Authors like Octavia E. Butler and Samuel R. Delaney are some of the most notable writers whose works fall under this category. Afrofuturism offers an optimistic view of the future for Black people, one where we not only exist, but also thrive. As graphic novelist Tim Fielder states in Taylor Crumpton's 2020 article, Afrofuturism has always looked forward. We have the power to show what an inclusive future looks like. We can show what ergonomic housing and transportation, food and water equality, as well as the dismantling of systemic racism looks like. When a narrative is embedded with those visuals, it takes on a more powerful connecting tissue. That is Afrofuturism. Much like Afrofuturism, Indigenous Futurism, Asian Futurism, Latinx Futurism, and Arab Futurism all strive to show that people of color have a place in the future and imagine the world free of systemic injustice. As Enright states, envisioning black, brown, and indigenous people through time and space, thriving in every space and time, dismantles the belief that we are relics of the past, stuck in a world in which settler colonialism has left us. The science fiction genre offers us an amazing lens to analyze our world, and when done right, can lead to some of the most impactful stories. Stories that stay in our minds, and if we're lucky, we can see them take root in reality. Sci-fi will forever be relevant because it piques our curiosity and answers our what-ifs. As the Damon Knight quote goes, What we get from science fiction, what keeps us reading it, in spite of our doubts and occasional disgust, is not different from the thing that makes mainstream stories rewarding but only expressed differently. We live on a minute island of known things. Our undiminished wonder at the mystery which surrounds us is what makes us human. 
in science fiction, we can approach that mystery, not in small everyday symbols, but in the big ones of space and time.